their first combat jump up at Sukchon above Pyongyang. And we jumped up in up there and uh, of course there was half our, half my company got killed. I was fortunate to make it out of there. And after I'd got wounded, I got wounded on March 25th. It was actually Easter Sunday, 1951. That's when I got shot in the leg. Got shot in the left leg. Uh, it was right on my records that I was wounded twice and told where and everything. I didn't know I'd never been given the Purple Heart. I didn't even know that. I always thought it was there, you know. Dad and my dad and my brother Perry, who's also a vet, um, were talking about the possibility of finding some more medical, you know, support. And so they went, they went down to the veterans office. Mr. Robinson came in, he had never filed for any veterans benefits. He had never went through this process before. He came in with his son and his family has been advocating for him for years solely to try to get his Purple Hearts recognized and have the awards. And he would come in for um, a specific issue to one of our veteran service officers. When they found out that the medals had not been presented, um, made sure that they were going that extra mile to put those um, into their record, make sure that his actions were in his service record um, so that he could get them. Uh, and then we were able to do a ceremony uh, with the legislative leadership, um, with our executive branch partners uh, over in the Capitol during legislative days. Um, just a powerful ceremony um, that really brought the community together and was a huge day of honor and recognition for Mr. Robinson. Because that was that was amazing what went on down there. And I, I lost it a couple times in there. I couldn't even speak, you know, because all that they'd done, you know. It was just the most amazing day. That's all I can say. I still get teary when I think about it because it was a day that they you know, set aside to recognize my dad for all that he did. When I was growing up, my dad was always helping people. I can't tell you how many times my siblings and I and my mom were sitting on the side of the road in the car while he helped somebody change a tire or took them to get gas or, you know, my dad taught me to be kind to other people and to care about what they were going through. So it meant a lot for me you know, growing up that way to see my dad be recognized for what he did. Not surprising that some of our service members um, can get caught up in the justice system uh, given some of the challenges that they face when they come home. Um, but a good opportunity for us to link, better link folks to services, whether mental health, addiction and treatment services, uh, often through that federal VA channel uh, to draw down those resources, make sure that we're getting them on the right track um, early, when, before they've um, gone deeper into the justice system. Um, but it's a great example of, um, you don't think of our court system as a veteran services entity, uh, but they are very much serving uh, our, you know, veterans across Oregon are going in front of courts every day. Um, and it's one opportunity on the back end uh, to make sure that they're not getting further off track in their lives. You know, my view is you break them, you fix them. We send these young men and women overseas to faraway places on North America, to other countries, even just to training. And if they're damaged, they get hurt, they get psychologically traumatized. We have a duty to sit down with them and work with them not just give them a band-aid and send them back into society. They've earned the right to be surrounded by people who care for them and support them. When you have a, a female veteran, for example, who comes in after serving in Iraq and, and being a 50 caliber gunner and not supposed to be in combat, you know how that works. And um, you know, hearing her story about having to ratchet back and you know, fight, which she wasn't expecting to. And the, the trauma that she suffered after that, seeing her friends die, um, and seeing her medicate inappropriately and become a heroin addict, frankly. And then when she was in chains and she was in jail, to see the transformation from that moment till now is amazing. I sacrificed. I'm a different person now because of my uh, deployments and because of my service to my country. And I'm proud of it. I wouldn't change anything. I'm proud to be a veteran. I'm proud to be a soldier. And uh, everything that I went through was for my country. So 
I'm not gonna give up and I'm not gonna stop. I'm really not, so I was trained better than that. I was raised better than that, so. To see her getting a hold of her life and understanding how important it is that she be there for her kids, that she find health, that she utilize the services. And to have somebody like that look you in the eyes and say, I'd be dead if it wasn't for this court. I gotta tell you, that, that hits me here. It, it means something to, to us who are involved in this team and desire to see these young men and women come back to health. Not unlike any of our citizens, uh, diverse needs that our veterans and their families face across health care, mental health, education, employment, housing, uh, and it can begin to boggle the mind how one small agency uh, with 80 dedicated team members uh, begins to address that challenge and address that issue. Um, we are a diverse group, male, female, urban and rural, um, every ethnicity and creed under the sun. Um, and with those diverse needs, how do we begin to move the needle on those outcomes, knowing that it's not always going to be our direct programs that speak to them? No one agency or organization can provide the full range of services that our veterans need. So each of us have a particular mandate and particular uh, list of resources to, to be able to take care of a piece of it, but none of us can do it all. It's only when we join together that we can provide the full range of services that our veterans and family members need so desperately. Veterans, are they learn to be tough. You know, women and men, when they join the military, they learn to be strong and they learn to take care of themselves and other people. And I think sometimes it's hard for veterans to first admit they need help, you know, and I think sitting down and having a conversation like Joe did with my dad, you find out things, you know, without them having to come forward and say, I need this or I need that. And I think that's important because we've, we've um, helped them to become independent and strong and they have served their country. And now it's time for us to, you know, find out what their needs are and what, what are the needs of their family even and try as a community to meet some of those needs if we can. But I think the purpose of having that community vet net, as you say, is that they can reach out to, let's say, our agency. And then we not only give them services and provide answers, but we also can connect them to the next community partner who can pick up from where we left off so that the veteran is getting a kind of multifaceted uh, benefit and awareness approach. So where it's not just, here's what I can do, the rest is out of my lane, and I don't know where to send you. It's, here's what I can do, let's get it done, and then here's the next place that you can go to get some solid answers. And just gives me a real sense of strength uh, and solace uh, to be able to give back uh, to who I served with um, and all previous generations that were standing on their shoulders. Um, there is something indescribable, indescribable um, about that bond across generations. Um, and I can't imagine working for any other state agency um, or any other organization. Um, this is truly a mission-driven organization um, dedicated to our veterans and their families.